we began last week with this very short wisdom series, and we spoke about the path to wisdom. And when we finished last week, we had the words of Solomon, the wisest person to have lived, who, who, who had this to say in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before, you're, before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Goes on to say a few other things in verse 9. He says, the words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives the sheep. But my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful, for writing books is endless and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. It's one thing to get on the path of wisdom. It's another thing to stay and to walk in wisdom. And we all want to walk in, we all want to walk in wisdom in many areas of our lives, whether it's you know, financially, relationally, our health, spiritually. Uh, we want to be in peak physical condition, uh, mental, our mental health all together. Spiritually, we want to be in touch with what the Lord is saying. And of course, when it comes to our career and the things that are driving us ahead, what is our purpose? We all want to be able to walk in wisdom. Now, at times, of course, our own personality, because we're all different, there are certain things that we are good at and there are certain things that we're not so good at. And then, of course, you add that our own idiosyncrasies, then you add our past, then you add our family environments, the way we grew in, the words that were spoken when we were young. Uh, they get in the way and thwart and stop us from really walking in wisdom. So, for instance, if you have a, uh, if one has an impulsive personality, they may struggle in the areas of finances. Why? Because most of the decisions that they make are based on, I just want it now. They cannot delay gratification. And so that creates a problem for you. You make spur of the moment decisions, think, oh, Bali and off you go. You book, and you're gone. The problem, though, I guess, is that that will create some problems in your life, uh, and, and it will stop you from really experiencing the freedom that you want in the area of your finances, and it also robs you of opportunities because you've squandered all, and so when an opportunity presents itself, that impulsive nature or the impulsive side of your personality has robbed you of opportunities that can bring you uh, new, uh, more and more freedom in that area. Now, this applies to relationships as well, that it will rob you of something. And so I used to come from, when we used to live in Port Hedland, I used to come down to Perth, and normally the flight, if I take a, a two o'clock flight, it would arrive at four o'clock, and by the time I get to the accommodation, it would be about 4.35. And I couldn't wait each time I would land. And this went on for successive trips. Each time I landed, I made my way to uh, Maya on Murray Street. And so I would go in there and I would purchase for myself articles of clothing. And I would do this very often. And sometimes I would buy maybe one or two sizes smaller and promised myself that you are going to lose weight. You know, so you do deserve you know, to get yourself all these things. And so I would do it, and I would do it. The problem was that the wardrobe was expanding, and so all of a sudden, I, you know, you buy these big bins, you know, the bins that you buy from uh, Bunnings, and I would throw all those clothes with their tags on, some of them never to be worn. And so I recall one afternoon, I was going through the same routine that I'd normally go through, and here we're talking about our past coming in and causing us to perhaps not walk in wisdom. And so I get down the escalator into the men's, de men's department, and a thought dropped in my mind that, and the, wor the words were, Stephen, do you know that if you remove two pairs of trousers on that rack, 
they're going to replace it with four. And the words that came was a word in my language that said, as repair, which means these things don't finish. These clothes don't run out. They will always be there. And in that moment, I realized that all this shopping that I was doing was filling an emotional need. And the reason I know it was filling an emotional need is because most of the clothes I never wore. And then when I would go on holiday, I would look like a very generous person and I'd be giving away, <laughs> you know, those clothes. But it was just because it was filling an emotional need. This is why sometimes our past and some of the issues that we've dealt with will come in and stop us from walking in wisdom because they will rob us of the things that are going to move our lives forward. John Maxwell in a blog called The Man in the Mirror says, the first person we must examine is ourselves. And he says that's the mirror principle. If our self-perception is distorted, then our attempts to influence others will be misguided and even manipulative. So the first person I must know, I must know is myself. And this brings me some self-awareness. The first person I must get along with is myself. This leads to a healthy self-image. The first person to cause me problems is myself. Therefore, admitting truth yields self-honesty. And then the first person I must change is myself. This empowering attitude paves the way to self-improvement. And so as we look to walk in wisdom in all areas of our lives, I believe that God is inviting us to trust him. In Proverbs, because this is the wisdom series coming out of the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 1 to 6, it says, My child, never forget the things that I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. It's like putting on a necklace. You know, men, we're not good at necklaces, but if you look at all the ladies, they got jewelry. That's what it's saying. Tie wisdom, like put, put it on like a necklace. And then it says, then you will find favor with both God and people, and you'll earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. If you would allow me just a little indulgence. Uh, last week, I, I mentioned, just as I was saying things in jest, uh, somehow that uh, I like old people. And it, it just happened that I made that comment, and then I said something about Pastor Charlie, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so the reason I say I love, you know, elderly people is this. There is a wealth of wisdom that they carry. And I, and I, and I say this with all honesty, is that, I saw, and I've mentioned this before, I saw a group of men, young and old, in Subiaco in 2018. This was in November 2018. It was possibly a week before I quit my job. And so I remember it very vivid. It was on a Saturday morning. And I was so jealous when I saw the range of ages. And I thought, wow, the wisdom that is being imparted to these other guys they're tapping into this collective wealth of wisdom so that they can live their lives better. That's what I mean when I say I love old people. Elderly people, sorry, is the better word to say. So our limited understanding can lead us astray. In Proverbs 16, verse 25, it says, there is a way, remember here we're saying, trust in the Lord with all your heart and, and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and then he'll show you which path to take. But Proverbs 16 says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And so when we choose to direct our lives according to what seems right to us, we often reap disaster. You know, there's a time in Judges, it says, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And we said last week that the beginning of fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. 
But when we start to do things in our own way, in, in, we do what we feel is right in our own eyes, it can lead to all sorts of disasters and troubles in our lives. And so this verse in Proverbs is essentially in, instructing us to put all our trust in, in the Lord and not on our own knowledge, not to be so reliant on our own strength and knowledge, but to trust in the Lord. So these are instructions when it comes to the biggest issue of our life, our salvation, we trust the Lord. But also when it comes to the everyday mysteries and challenges of life that we face, Sometimes we're not able to figure out what God is doing in our lives. Uh, we don't know what's going on. But our Christian faith would tell us that God knows what is going on and he is in control and, we would, and I will trust him. And so we put our faith in him. And so our commitment to the Lord must incorporate our whole life, spirit, soul, and body. And then this is reflected in our lifestyle our outlook, our attitudes, our conversation, and our character, and even our worldview is dependent on what the Lord says the worldview is. And so when we place our trust in him with childlike confidence, he fills our heart with his own perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. So the key thing here is that when we are walking in wisdom and relationship, it doesn't mean we suspend the ability to think because we have to be able to think. Eh? God has given us a mind to think. He's given us dominion, but also to know his voice so that when the storms of life get cloudy, we are able to recognize the Lord's voice. And this is very important in our lives that we're able to recognize the Lord's voice. And also what happens is that we don't move until we get a release from the Holy Spirit. So whenever it comes to major decisions in our lives, one of the, we, what we learned last week is that we seek the Lord and we give it to the Lord, and then we seek counsel from those around us, and then we only move up until we get a release from the Holy Spirit to say, boom, go ahead. Now, this is, you're not going to get much direction from the Lord if it comes to every morning thinking the Lord is going to tell you to get up and shower, we're not talking about those kind of decisions. We're talking about major, major decisions. This is what you do when you're walking with the Lord. But for the mundane stuff, we've been given the ability to think and to organize for ourselves. So it, trusting him comes naturally when you know somebody. I can trust you. You can trust me when you know me. If you don't know me, you've got no need to trust me. Because you cannot trust someone you don't know and you cannot rely on them. But God is trustworthy and faithful and has proven himself throughout the Bible. So when we spend time to read the scriptures, we will know God, we will know his ways, and we are familiar with his will. David in Psalm chapter 3 was in a heap of trouble. But because he was in relationship with God, he said this. Remember we're saying here is that as we walk in wisdom, God is essentially inviting us to trust him. So because David knew the Lord and trusted him, he says, But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I laid down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. And I'm not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. When he said this, David was fleeing from an army sent by his own son. And it was because of somebody through an influence of an ally that this army did not rush on David at a vulnerable moment. He overcame the threats and taunts of the enemy by trusting in the Lord. He addresses the Lord as a shield around him, his glory and the lifter up of his head. So you can imagine when you are downcast, what do you normally do when you're downcast? You know, you hold your head down and then he says, he lifted up, he is a lifter of our head. So we no longer are downcast. And so a shield protects a warrior from swords, arrows, darts, and spears. So he envisioned the Lord protecting him. Now, this is why the Lord says, uh, uh, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12, 
trust the Lord in your youth. Because remember, in his youth, he said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And then he says, this day the Lord will deliver me into, deliver you into my hand. And we can see the progression of David's life, that because he was in relationship with the Lord, he could trust him when things were really against him. Amen. This is what happens when we're walking with the Lord. We could have trusted him from our, our young age or wherever in life we are. This should tell us that we need to constantly be in relationship with the Lord so that we're developing our relationship and trusting in him. <clears throat> I recall, uh, so God expects us to trust him with all our heart and not just a part of it. And you know, sometimes when we trust the Lord, there is no plan B. Lord, I'm going to trust you. You will provide for me. You're going to provide for me a spouse. You provide for me whatever it is that I need for my business, for my life, for my children. There is no plan B. This is what he wants. Because you see, when we question his abilities, we will always put in a plan B in our lives. We put our trust in him because we know that he won't let us down when we follow his ways. Tim Keller writes about the mysterious way our free will decisions intricately work in, con in, jun in conjunction with God's sovereignty for his glory. In a sermon titled, Christ Our Head, he says, God is so great that he works out a plan, a plan to work everything out for your good if you belong to him and his glory which takes into consideration your choices and still works out his plan it works out his plan out infallibly John Finkeldy spoke a message in Port Hedland in 2018 on decision making and trusting the Lord and I had already decided to make a career change and to change my job but I don't think I had exercised proper wisdom in fact what had happened was that I had spoken to a mentor of mine and he said, okay, this is the plan. I put my plan to him and he says, yep, good plan. Let's work on that. And then something happened that I said, well, stuff that plan, I'm leaving now. Now, this is my personality coming in play, in play now that's working against me. And I said, I, I will throw out all wisdom. All I'm going to do is trust in the Lord. And so I said, Lord, um, we're doing this. We're, we're changing jobs. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm starting up a business. And I remember thinking, in fact, somebody said to me, oh, did you follow that process when you made your decision? And I'm like, oh, it's too late now. John was one week or two weeks too late. My process, driven by my personality, did not exercise a lot of science around it, a lot of thinking. Yes, I had spoken to somebody about it, but then I just, because circumstances changed, I went ahead with my decision. And boy, did it get me into a whole lot of trouble. I just said, Lord, I'm leaving. You know, Peter just says, Lord, let's do this. You know, let's do this. Just that person, like, yep, wait, Lord, I'm doing this. You know, uh, you're not going to go to the cross. You just say all those rash and brash things. That's the kind of person that I would say I used to be. Um, but who knows? This is going back to what Tim Keller said, that... God will use even your own personal foolishness to propel you in the direction of your destiny. Look at Joseph. Joseph was hated by his brothers. One, because his father loved him very much. And secondly, he was also so unwise that he would tell his brothers the dreams that he was having of, of, of them bowing down to him. And it said that when he said that to them, they hated him even more. And so they planned, you know what, let's get rid of this guy. We're sick of him. He thinks he's somebody. And this is what sometimes our foolishness will get us into a whole lot of trouble. But you know that God is trustworthy because even throughout us not walking in wisdom, God is somehow going to meander us through his ways and somehow we will come out on top. Amen? And so even in my church life, I never, I cannot say I heard the Lord say, 
Stephen served the youth. I just did it. That was just my experience. Uh, serving church leadership in Port Hedland in Alice Springs. I, you know what? It was there to do, and I did it. I think that sometimes the thing that we perhaps may struggle with is where do I fit in? What's my purpose in life? And that can really get us bogged down. But I say that you discover things on the road. You discover things as you're walking. And that's been my personal experience. It's been a bit of trial and error. Trying this, oof, that's not working, I wasn't that good. Trying that, possibly getting outside your comfort zone and taking risks. Because this is what we have to be able to do is that we've thought about something, we've prayed about it, we've sought the counsel of other people, then we take risks. And my encouragement is fail early and make adjustments very quickly. So it's fail quickly, you adjust. Don't wait until you're later on in life and then you want to start. No, no, no. Start, you fail early, make a decision. If it's not working, you switch very quickly. And like I said earlier, to make major decisions, pray about it, consult with trusted counselors, and take a step of faith. Now, if the scripture says, if you are thinking, asking the Lord, uh, Lord, I want to go out with so-and-so, but they're not a Christian, well, you got your answer straight there. Don't do it, because you got the word of God, where we know what the will of God is for our lives. But anything other than that, we pray about it. If it's in the will of God, boom, seek the counsel of other people, and then we take a step of faith. And then we make adjustments if things are not working, if we feel that, oh, possibly I made the wrong decision, because we are all prone to make wrong decisions um, one time or another. One of the key things we have to do as well on our walk to wisdom, walking in wisdom, is we have to embrace correction. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you for the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Walking in wisdom means that we may not get it right. Therefore, we should love correction and discipline and we should not reject it. Whether we know it or not, we are constantly getting corrected and disciplined. At work, they give you performance appraisals. That's correction right there telling us you're not doing good in this area, you can do better in that area. At most times, feedback is hard to take, but it's necessary. So we need to take it. You say to somebody, I've got some feedback for you. Just brace yourself and say, fire away. But most importantly, recognize when feedback, when it's done in love, it doesn't injure, but it soothes. But when it's done, I guess, with somebody who's just being spiteful, it's meant, that feedback is meant to injure you. That's when you know what the difference is. You see, it will injure or sting at first, but upon reflection, it will soothe you because you recognize that this is for your good. Not all medicine is sweet. So sometimes we just have to take it. And so we have to see correction as a sign of love and not rejection. And then common sense. We have to exercise some common sense and discernment. Proverbs 3, verse 30, 21 to 26 says, My child, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment. Hang on to them, for they will refresh your soul. They are like jewels on a necklace. They keep you safe on your way, and your feet will not stumble. You can go to bed without fear. You will lie down and sleep soundly. You need not to be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. For the Lord is your security. He will keep your foot from being caught in a trap. You might exercise all the wisdom. But that doesn't mean that the best life is not going to happen to you. Because I don't want you to think that, okay, just because that scripture says I've got wisdom around my neck and I've got discernment, bad things are not going to happen to me. No, life happens to all of us. But it's always better that it happens to you when you're following the Lord's direction rather than when you're not. Amen. I'll get us to stand this morning as we finish.
In this scripture, as we finish, the concept of discernment or discretion is applauded. Discretion implies making sound decisions, especially between some options. Where we think through things, we assess, and we know when to act and when not to act. Alan Sorensen's thoughts on this scripture go like this. Solomon reminds his son the importance of staying focused on God's wisdom and discretion. And you see, it's not just knowing what it is, but also aligning the heart to surrender to that. So let's not let God's word and the instruction of his Holy Spirit depart from our sight as we walk in this world. There are many things that are clamoring uh, for our attention, for us to listen to them. So if we listen to what the world is saying to us and we heed what it's saying, then it's not wisdom because it will lead our lives being lived in a manner that is below what God wants for us. As we stay focused on God and his word, we live a life of meaning and of purpose. And just as it says here, put on, you know, he's talking about wisdom here, tied around your neck, common sense, wisdom, and discernment. It's just like what Paul says in Ephesians, put on the whole armor of God. And he says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil.